Good, good morning. Good morning. Um, it's my privilege to be with you today. I'm Pastor Dave Van Clay, uh, retired pastor of the church, and uh, as Michael is is over at Scandia for the annual meeting, I'm covering for him with you this morning. I enjoyed the squeaky cheese downstairs, um, <laughs> or over in the fellowship hall. It was great, and it's good to see your faces today. I understand that this is the first week when people haven't been wearing masks. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so I, I would say that when I give communion, we're going to have communion up here at the altar. I will wear a mask, uh, although I'm doubly vaccinated, as I'm sure most of you are as well. Um, so it's kind of an odd time when we're trying to figure out just how to be respectful to everybody and, and to be safe and, and yet also to be a bit free again um, and to live into this moment. Well, we'll have uh, some announcements later, but uh, with those, uh, those words of welcome, we begin now with Confession and Forgiveness, page 94 or 95 in your book. As you're able, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. O most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear friends, God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, now strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We sing together.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. together. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning comes to us from the third chapter of Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, it is good for one to hear the yoke in mouth, in youth. To sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. The psalm tone for today can be found on page 338. It is tone number 11. And now here is the refrain for today. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. Let's all sing that together. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. 
and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. God's wrath is short, God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit. Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. I will exalt you, O turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. And our second reading this morning comes to us from the eighth chapter of Second Corinthians. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in us utmost eagerness, in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, and though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you, who began last year, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need. 
so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace now and be healed of your disease. While he was Still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in there where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately, the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know this, but told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, again, let me just say it's so good to have to be here with you and uh, the kids who are here today too. You know, it's so good to have them here. So we're glad they're here, like the 12-year-old in the story. You know, most of us here are old enough to remember the time before Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, before CNN and Fox, before cable and satellite TV, when the only viewing options were the three networks and PBS. 
Although if you lived in Market County, it was just TV6 and PBS way back when, you remember. Since there were so few options, a particular TV series could capture a huge share of the American audience on a given night. And one of those which ran during the 60s and 70s was Mission Impossible. You remember it, don't you? A spy thriller in which each episode began with the agents receiving a communication from headquarters, asking them to complete some seemingly impossible task. The rest of the episode detailed how they were, in fact, able to execute the assignment, often through the, the use of, of some technological gadget, like a camera and a pencil, along with brilliant deceptions that kept us guessing as the plot unfolded. Mission impossible. And that would be a, a good way to describe Jesus' assignment in today's gospel. Here, Mark inserts one story inside of another the way you would put a piece of cheese between two slices of bread to make a sandwich. And he does this, he puts these two stories together so we can see the connection between the two because in both of them, Jesus does things that seem impossible. One concerns a certain woman who has been suffering from bleeding for 12 years and she's seen all the doctors bend to the first century version of UP health systems and, and Mayo Clinic. And no one has been able to help her. Indeed, indeed, all their ministrations only seem to make things worse. But having heard of Jesus, she threads her way through the crowd following him, believing if somehow she manages just to touch the hem of his garment, she will feel better. And the moment she touches his cloak, indeed, she feels a difference when Jesus discovers this, he calls her daughter and tells her to go home healed of her disease. The woman's healing is more than physical. A woman with a flow of blood was regarded as unclean and cut off from the community. Now healed from her disease, she could rejoin her friends and family, which, as we have come to realize through this pandemic, is a very big deal. Also, she could not bear children in this condition in the first century, which was a big deal. Perhaps now she might even be able to bring a new life into the world. But even before this happens, Jesus is approached by the leader of the synagogue, the kind of person who we would expect to be hostile toward him, but this man, Jairus, is desperate, and his 12-year-old is sick unto death. And so clinging to his last shred of hope, he falls down before Jesus and begs him repeatedly, the text says, over and over again, please come and lay your hands on my daughter, and she will live. Delayed by the woman with the hemorrhage, Jesus doesn't make it in time. The girl dies and so is beyond any hope of recovery at all. But this cannot, even this cannot frustrate Jesus' purpose. In a beautiful scene, he takes the child by the hand and says, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And when she begins to move about, the first thing he says to the family is give her something to eat, help her to live and thrive again. Mission impossible becomes mission accomplished. Friends, these two stories are so rich. Uh, they tell us that even when things seem hopeless, no situation is truly beyond hope. That people who would seem to be the least respectable or the least powerful in society are nonetheless prioritized by God for grace. That if we believe in God's power to heal, or want to believe in it, or struggle to believe enough to ask for it, God is able to give us even more than we dare to hope for. 
that the healing power of God was in Jesus and is now yet in Jesus. Think about your own life. Perhaps we are dealing with an illness or with the aches and pains that come with aging and have done everything there is to do, seen all the specialists, tried the medications with no or limited success. We may have just about given up hope. This text invites us simply to put our trust in the healing power of God in Christ. What that means, we don't know. Perhaps physical healing may yet take place, or we may be healed in some way we can't even imagine at the moment, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. But the point is, we do have agency in all this. We are not without hope. We can draw on the healing power of God in Christ. About a week ago, my friend, our former bishop, Dale Skogman, died. More than 17 years earlier, he was diagnosed with a terminal illness and given three to five years to live. But day by day, year by year, he looked to Christ for healing and lived a full life. And even as he lay dying, Dale drew on the power of the one who said, those who believe in me, Though they die, yet shall they live, and those who live and believe in me shall never die. I can well imagine that today Jesus is taking him by the hand and saying something like, Talitha kum. What about this congregation? I expect you felt at times that Bethany has been at the point of death. No doubt you remember when your church was larger, when these pews were filled and there were plenty of willing volunteers to carry out its mission. Forget all that. Believe this. There is no telling what can be accomplished here in this community if though few in number, you trust the healing power of Christ to work through you. Let the Spirit help you dream a new future. What about all the impossible dilemmas that concern all of us today, like climate change or systemic racism or the cancer of hate we see not only in this country but around the world? Because the crucified Christ is risen and at work in this world, is anything impossible? Now, the Berlin Wall came down. South Africa integrated. The Great Lakes were cleaned up. Vaccines came along. Is anything impossible? You know, uh, another one of these impossible dilemmas is economic inequality. You've heard about this. You know, the top 1% of people in America have 43% of our wealth, and the bottom half possesses 2%. It's crazy, isn't it? If you've ever traveled in the developing world, as I, I have, you know it's not just here. That's the tip of the iceberg. Vast areas of Africa, Asia, and Latin America lack electricity, clean water, Food. People have nothing. A friend from Colombia who lived in these circumstances as a child and a young man was given a grant to study in the U.S. and later served as an intern pastor near where I was on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, Shannon County, which comprises the reservation, was then the poorest county in the whole nation. My friend looked around at the rundown trailers and the rows of government houses there and said, my friends and neighbors would give anything for one of these. If you don't see this as a spiritual issue, think again, because way back in 50 AD, 
when St. Paul wrote this second lesson, was dealing with exactly the same thing. The church in Judea was very poor. People were hungry. And so Paul asks other Christian communities, Gentile churches, to share their resources. He goes to Macedonia, where the church is also very poor. Philippi, Thessalonica. And people cannot wait to help. They respond with amazing generosity, going beyond their means, he says, because they were overflowing with gratitude for what God in Christ had done for them. And now the second lesson is, is his appeal to a wealthier church in Corinth. It's your turn, he says. I don't mean that there should be relief to others and pressure on you. This is rather a question of finding a fair balance between your present abundance and their need. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Wow. We can talk all day about political strategies to address economic inequality, but in Paul's mind, it begins with grateful Christians like you and me sharing what we have. When we do this, it's as if we touch the hem of Jesus' garment so that healing flows from him through us to the world. There's so many things you could draw from this text. But often it's just in simple ways like this that Christ Jesus works his miracles until the kingdom of God dawns at last and mission impossible becomes mission accomplished. Amen.
Let us join together in an expression of our faith, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray together the prayers of intercession found in the Celebrate insert. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel so that your good news all might, that through your good news all might experience transformation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food, guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate, and empower us to protect all you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources, that none, none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical or mental illness. Embrace those who are sick. At this time, we ask you that you lift up those on our prayer list, our friends, our neighbors, and others that you may wish to bring before now. Embrace those who are sick. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship, revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors of, in every age whose lives have pointed us towards you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. And also, I think we pray today for the people in Florida who are waiting for news of their loved ones under that rubble. Continue to pray for them. Hold out some hope for them. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that gift for one another. God's peace be with you. <laughs> God's peace be with you. Whatever. God's peace be with you. Let us pray. 
Oh, good and gracious God, receive our gifts, the gifts that we offer, as signs of our willingness to live our whole lives for you and for the others that you have called us to love. Receive these gifts and use them through our congregation and, and to, to care for others and to proclaim your, your, good, your good word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection has opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Please stand. Holy God, you alone are holy. You alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. We praise you, O God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We bless you, O oh God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O oh God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And afterward, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit in our gathering, within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And as you come forward to receive communion, um, you'll receive a wafer and then the grape juice is in the middle and the light colored glasses and the rest is wine. And uh, on the way back, I think you put the 
wine cups in there, right? Right. All this ready. As you're able, again, I would invite you to stand, <clears throat> receive this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ now strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life and love. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys alongside us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing the sending song.
Jesus.